From creepy and quiet public ponds, rumored to hold dark secrets beneath deceptively calm waters, to prestigious Great Lakes, where it's said restless spirits resulting from countless shipwrecks still roam after dark. Are you ready for the most haunted lakes in the United States? Number 5. Gardner Lake Gardner Lake is a natural lake sitting right on the border of the towns of Salem, Montville, and Basra, all in Connecticut, that contains within its boundaries the Mini Island State Park, which is both the only island in the lake as well as the state's smallest state park. Land surrounding the lake was originally inhabited by the Mohegan and Pequot peoples, with the first Europeans arriving and settling through the 1640s. Through the 17th and 18th centuries, a number of small villages and homesteads followed. Both Montville and Basra were incorporated as their own towns in 1786, with Salem following later in 1819 on lands from Montville, Lyme, and Colchester. During the winter of 1895, one Thomas LeCount decided that he wanted his summer house, which was located on Gardner Lake's south shore, relocated to its er, east shore for whatever reason. It was decided it would be more efficient to pull the house across the frozen waters rather than utilize the snow-covered road. Predictably, the house became stuck, eventually breaking through the ice and sinking to the bottom of the lake. Mini Island State Park was established at the lake in 1925, after it was discovered that neither Salem nor Montville had claimed it yet, and that squatters were slowly transforming it into a makeshift village. In 1954, Homemead State Park was established on land that had previously acted as a farm to one Solomon Gardner, after whom the lake takes its name. Gardner Lake State Park was officially established in 2001 at the site of a former beach resort. Gardner Lake remains open to the public year-round, offering campsites and waters perfect for boating, swimming, scuba diving, and fishing. When the LeCount family lost their home in the lake, they were forced to abandon a number of important personal possessions to its depths, one of these possessions being an old piano. Visitors to the lake have reported hearing eerie piano music drifting over the waters or surrounding them seemingly coming from all directions. Scuba divers to the lake, especially those nearing the old house's remnants, have reported feeling as if this music is overwhelming them, forcing many to surface. This spooky serenade is most often heard in the dead of night, some say namely under full moons or during heavy fog. Number 4. Haunted Lake Haunted Lake, also known as Scobie Pond, is a shallow body of water located to the east of the village of Francistown in New Hampshire that earned its spooky moniker from local legends dating back to pre-colonial times. Official town history tells that said legends were birthed following a large fire that left the area looking charred, dead, and rather ominous. By some accounts, the blaze killed all people and creatures nearby, and the land's foreboding appearance has even been noted by a number of both native and European explorers and surveyors. When the Honorable Matthew Patton surveyed the area in 1753, he wrote that he, accompanied by two assistants, set up camp near the pond. He reported that not long after sunset, they began hearing otherworldly groaning and shrieks from the water, as though people were being tortured through the darkness. These sounds continued until dawn. The area of Francistown was first settled in 1758 and was later incorporated in 1772. In 1780, David Scobie would build a saw and grist mill along the lake's outlet. By 1790, the town's population had grown to 982. The Scobie family would maintain the mill until selling it to one Daniel Fuller, who would continue operations until 1860, after which both properties would be left abandoned. Today, the lake, or depending on who you talk to, pond, is owned by Francistown, with several residents owning pieces of its shoreline, and is a popular stop among anglers and kayakers. True to its name and to the stories, many visiting Haunted Lake report the very same groans, screams, and shrieks reported by native peoples and by Patton so long ago, as well as full-bodied apparitions in clothing spanning the eras, shadowy figures sighted darting about, and orbs and mists that appear in the backgrounds of photographs. Another legend tells that at some point, David Scobie's workmen actually uncovered the skeleton of a young man. Some say a hunter who died mid-hunt and was buried by friends. Others, the victim of a brutal murder. Whatever the case, his ghost has been sighted roaming the banks, moaning, seemingly seeking help. 
Also reported across the lake are random bursts of freezing cold wind in the dead of summer and the feeling of being constantly watched. Lastly, David Scobie himself passed on in 1829 at the ripe old age of 86 after falling through thin ice while attempting to transfer a load of logs. To this day, many have reported hearing splashing at night, sometimes accompanied by shouts that quickly dies out. Number 3. White Rock Lake White Rock Lake to the northeast of downtown Dallas, Texas is a reservoir spanning more than 1,000 acres. Its park area is one of the most heavily used parks in the Dallas park system, and its grounds offer a wide range of activities. Before the reservoir was created, land that now holds White Rock once acted as a collection of farms that was owned by the Daniel and Cox families. Through the 1830s, Thomas Walker Daniel, accompanied by his wife, Frances, moved to the area to start a farm. Following the American Civil War, they were joined by their son's friend's family, the Coxes, who moved on to adjacent land. Construction of the White Rock Dam along White Rock Creek was started in 1910 and was completed by 1911, with the lake being filled by 1913. Various interests quickly swooped in on land surrounding the lake, and residential construction began sprouting up pretty much everywhere. Through the early 1930s, the Dallas Park Board, with the help of the Civilian Conservation Corps, began developing portions of the lakeshore into a municipal park. The White Rock CCC Camp was established at Winfrey Point, and later, through the 1930s, the reservoir was both widened and deepened. During World War II, the lake's CCC Camp was utilized by the U.S. Army as a camp for new recruits, and in 1943, it would even house German POWs. Although swimming in the lake was originally allowed, the act was banned in 1952, followed closely by a ban on motorized boats in 1958. These bans were issued to ensure the sanitary state of the reservoir's water for use during droughts. Today, while White Rock no longer serves to supply the city's water, swimming is still prohibited due to high levels of bacteria and contamination. The lake and its park are primarily utilized for sailing, kayaking, canoeing, paddleboarding, hiking, running, biking, and fishing. The most famous local legend to emerge from the reservoir's depths tells of the infamous Lady of White Rock Lake. As the story goes, sometime through the 1930s, a young woman of about 20 years in age was killed, either in a boating or car accident, leaving her soul restless. Reports of encounters with her apparition started in 1943, when a young couple described turning on their headlights to find her spectral form standing in front of their vehicle, staring in. To this day, many motorists through the area, namely around East Lothar Drive, have reported coming across a beautiful young woman clad in an evening dress from the 1930s, soaking wet from head to toe and seemingly in distress. This woman has been known to flag down cars asking for a ride home, only to disappear mid-drive. Several other versions of this tale tell that the ghostly woman appears in a Neiman Marcus dress or gives different home addresses each time, leading some to speculate there may actually be multiple female entities along the lake shores. Lastly, and possibly most chillingly, are accounts from locals who tell of waking to find the Lady of White Rock Lake on their front porch in the middle of the night, asking to use a phone before disappearing, leaving nothing but a puddle in her wake. Number 2. Lake Superior Lake Superior, bordered by the U.S. states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and also bordered by the Canadian province of Ontario, boasts the titles of being the largest of the Great Lakes of North America, the world's largest freshwater lake by surface area, and the third largest lake on Earth by sheer volume. The first people to reach the region arrived sometime around 8000 BCE, after the retreat of the glaciers in the last ice age. By 500 BCE, the local laurel were trading with different regions, and by the early 1600s, the Ojibwe had established a village of several thousand on Madeline Island. Around 1622, French explorer Samuel de Champlain and his scout Etienne Brule became the first documented Europeans to lay eyes on the impressive body of water. In 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company was formed and fur trading throughout the region began. In 1770, Alexander Henry organized a mining operation and began charting the area for its copper deposits. And in 1793, the first Sioux locks were constructed to bypass the rapids at Salt St. Marie to make for easier transport of goods between Superior and Huron. 
1821, Northwest Company would merge with Hudson's Bay. The La Pointe Treaty of 1854 would cede the entire Minnesota shoreline to the United States, resulting in interested parties quickly purchasing land near the lake in hopes of striking profit in copper. Today, many of the towns and landmarks surrounding Superior have risen from former mining or shipping settlements. The lake offers extensive opportunities for boating, swimming, camping, fishing, hiking, and pretty much anything lake-related you can dream up. Disturbingly, there have been over 350 recorded shipwrecks in Superior, though this number has been disputed up into the thousands, accompanied by an estimated 10,000 lives lost in its waters. Many of the bodies never recovered. Incidentally, the southern shore of the lake between Grand Marais, Michigan, and Whitefish Point, a point which has claimed more ships than any other area of Superior, is commonly referred to as the Graveyard of the Great Lakes. The section's many submerged shipwrecks are now protected by the Whitefish Point Underwater Preserve. According to local lore, and we quote, Lake Superior never gives up her dead. This legend formed from the fact that, due to the water's cold temperatures that inhibit normal bacterial growth, bodies would always sink to the bottom instead of floating, never to be seen again. On top of this, Superior is also said to have surprisingly strong currents and undercurrents that are more than capable of catching even experienced swimmers off guard, and that have resulted in a number of drownings. The most recent and famous shipwreck to take place in Superior was the 1975 wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, an accident that took 29 of its crew members with it. Many visitors to the lake report sighting phantom ships on its waters, the most frequently experienced of which just might be the Fitzgerald, most often at sundown or during full moons. Shockingly, many have captured these ghost ships in photos and videos. Also disturbing are stories from divers who explore the shipwrecks and later report being followed around by spectral sailors or shadowy figures, all spirits thought to be trapped by the water's icy embrace. Number 1. Stowe Lake Stowe Lake, out of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, California, is a man-made lake acting as an oasis to the city. Its park grounds serve as the third most visited park in the country, just after Central Park and the Lincoln Memorial, respectively. It all started through the 1860s, when the community of San Francisco began requesting a city park that fit as something similar to that Central Park New York was working on. In 1871, the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department was formed in an effort to oversee the development of Golden Gate Park. The chunk of land selected to hold the park, however, was nothing more than an unstable plot of sand dunes at the time, forcing massive terraforming efforts in the form of extensive reforestation in hope the trees would stabilize the ground. By 1875, about 60,000 trees had been planted. The park's first formal structure was introduced in the form of the Conservatory of Flowers, which opened in 1879. Stowe Lake, along with its boathouse, were finished in 1893, and a year later, in 1894, the park hosted the Midwinter International Exposition, the first World's Fair to be held in the U.S. west of the Mississippi. Following the earthquake and fire of 1906, more than 200,000 homeless residents were forced into the park to seek refuge. The original boathouse was destroyed in a blaze in 1937, but was reconstructed between 1946 and 1949. In 2011, the current boathouse was leased to one Ortega Family Enterprises, an operation managing a number of concessions in multiple national parks. The company went on to remodel the building, painting its exterior while installing a small indoor cafe. Today, both the lake and park are popular places for picnics, boating, wildlife viewing, family events, and so much more. The most famous local legend surrounding Stowe tells that sometime in the late 1800s or early 1900s, a young woman was visiting the park with her baby when she ran into an old friend. The two sat down at a park bench to chat, catching up, but while the mother was distracted, her baby stroller began to roll, plunging straight into the lake, with the baby fastened inside. It's said that when the mother realized her child was missing, that she went insane. She began questioning everyone in the park, asking if they'd seen her baby, not aware that if she'd been watching, she may have had time to make a rescue. 
The first reports of paranormal phenomenon resulting from this incident occurred in 1908 when a speeding car was stopped by police alongside the park. When officers approached the car, they found all inside pale, terrified, and shaking. The party explained that, as they were relaxing lakeside, a ghostly woman in a glowing white dress materialized in front of their car, visibly deranged or aggravated over something, and approached them with such ferocity it resulted in them fleeing the scene. Reported all across Stowe are extreme cold spots in the heat of summer, strange winds that kick up on calm nights and that are seemingly isolated to surrounding individuals or groups, and disembodied voices heard over the waters. Another local legend which some claim is related to the first but most agree is a separate story and phenomena altogether tells that a mother was out on the lake in a boat with her child, enjoying a peaceful afternoon when, by accident, their boat capsized, resulting in both drowning. To this day, many visiting Stowe report spying a ghostly boat carrying two silhouettes, seemingly those of a mother and her child adrift in the early hours of the morning, a scene that quickly fades from sight. Also reported around Stowe are orbs and mists captured in photographs, the ghostly sounds of babies crying, and the feeling of being watched, followed, and even tugged at by something unseen. Lastly, one final local legend tells that anyone who visits the lake after dark should do so at their own risk that they're likely to encounter the ghostly mother from our first tale, who seemingly made a habit of hunting down lone lake goers in order to ask them that one important question. Have you seen my baby? Laura tells, for those who claim they don't know where the child is, that she'll ask for assistance in searching and will continue to haunt them until she feels they've earnestly tried to help her. While interacting with this specter, one should exercise extreme caution, as it's said that if you lie to her and tell her that you do know where her child is, while you actually don't, that she'll attack you, either killing you brutally or dragging you back to the heart of the lake to share in her grisly fate. Taking into consideration its ridiculously fascinating, notable, and progressive history, and coupling those with a string of ghost stories and urban legends sure to leave even the bravest with bad dreams, we felt there was no better choice than Stowe as our pick for the most haunted lake in the United States. Thank you all for tuning in to our list of picks for the most haunted lakes in the United States. If you enjoyed hearing our histories and stories as much as we enjoyed telling them to you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on so you know when fresh content is on the way. Throw us a like if you feel we've earned it, and most importantly, share this video and our channel with anyone you think deserves a good scare. We'll catch you all next time, if something else doesn't first.